Connecting two worlds has become sort of a staple of the Zelda experience. Past and future, light and shadow, even the land and sky. The adventures of our favorite green-clad Hylian have often required us to build bridges, form alliances, and journey across the expanse in order to defeat the powers of evil. But it's not just the disparate realms of Hyrule that our hero has brought together over the years. He has consistently blended the best of his past inspirations to influence each new game in the series. So by the time Zelda got its third title, there was already a commonwealth of both new and old ideas that would merge together to form one of the most iconic, legendary adventures of all time. Hi there, my name is Daniel, and I think The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past is super creative. Nineteen ninety. In five short years, Nintendo had revitalized the gaming industry with a simple, solid idea. Miyamoto and his team had accomplished so much, but in Mario's case, these accomplishments came incrementally across five main series titles. And while the gameplay of Super Mario World is certainly more refined than its older brother on the NES, it's pretty easy to see how the developers slowly built on their original foundation. When it comes to The Legend of Zelda, though, this transition into 16-bit gaming felt like a much greater leap. The same amount of time it took Mario to pump out five adventures only yielded three for Zelda, so the technical and mechanical steps taken by each game had to be a bit larger to keep up. And the real kicker is this guy right here. Zelda 2 was such a radical shift from the first game that it honestly feels a bit jarring today. And I mean, Mario did this too. Super Mario Bros. 2 experimented with a whole host of unique features and is also considered the black sheep of its series. But that was still a side-scroller and shared much of its basic mechanics with the first title. Zelda 2, on the other hand, was so much different than the original that any step forward for the series was going to have a tough time honoring the legacy of both. Just from a gameplay perspective, our guys Miyamoto and Tezuka needed to choose between this and this. One would be cemented as the foundational formula for the series, while the other would slowly fade into obscurity. And while their final product is, on the surface, a clear reflection of the first game's formula, I would actually argue that this legendary classic borrows more from Zelda's forgotten little brother than you might realize. Believe it or not, there was an age before the Zelda timeline looked like this. A Link to the Past was the third game in the series, and it served as a prequel of sorts for the first game. Different Link, but same timeline. And A Link to the Past does a ton to expand on the series' lore. Before the game even starts, we learn about this place called the Golden Land and the hidden power that resides there. And if you've played pretty much any game in the series, you probably know where this is going. The hidden power is the Triforce, and this is actually the most we've seen of it in the series so far. The first game introduced us to the Triforce of Wisdom, which was shattered by Zelda, and the Triforce of Power, wielded by our best boy Ganon. Then Zelda 2 brought in the Triforce of Courage, which Link has to prove himself to earn. But this time, we got the whole thing. And as a whole, the Triforce is capable of granting the wish of whoever possesses it. This is why, ever since Ganon got his grubby paws on it, the Golden Land has actually been transformed into the Dark World which serves as a twisted counterpart to, you guessed it, the Light World. And it's within these two dimensions of Hyrule that our adventure takes place. But before we even see the Dark World, we get to spend plenty of time reacquainting ourselves with Link and his home. It's been a while since we've seen Link from this perspective, and both he and Hyrule have gotten some major upgrades in that time. For starters, Hyrule looks gorgeous now and it's clear to see how Zelda 2's emphasis on towns and culture has livened up the previously barren kingdom. The beauty and grandeur of Hyrule's diverse landscapes is on full display thanks to the upgraded hardware of the Super Nintendo. 
And it's not just the world that's more fully realized, which is evident from the moment Link jumps out of bed. Your movement is no longer confined to just four directions, and Link now swings his sword rather than stabbing enemies to allow for a larger range of hitboxes. In fact, Link's now signature spin attack was included as a way to compensate for his original lack of diagonal attacking options. Link may not have as many techniques as he did in Zelda 2, but it's cool to see the spirit of that title's combat depth make it into this game. More button inputs also means more tools at Link's disposal, and A Link to the Past really packs more in the old adventure pouch than ever before. Making the return from the original, we've got the bow, bombs, boomerang, and power gloves, all with fancy new upgrades that you can get later on. Then there's the magical items, which have Zelda 2 written all over them. This game may have ditched the previous title's level up mechanics, but your magic rods, spells, and equipment do use up the Zelda 2 inspired magic meter. And I haven't even mentioned the items that are new to this adventure. With the Pegasus boots and Zora flippers, Link has never been more agile. And do I even need to mention the hookshot? which might just be the most iconic item in the series. This game also introduced bottles, which can store potions, fairies, and other helpful things. How does Link carry all this stuff? I have no freaking clue. But you'll need it all if you want to explore every inch of Hyrule. And trust me, you want to explore every inch of Hyrule. Not only is this game super punishing in later fights, but the hidden goodies you'll find as you explore are just genuinely helpful. Prior to Breath of the Wild, the Zelda series has been criticized for being a bit too simple and handholdy, especially in later titles. But that's certainly not the case here. A second row of hearts and, say, Skyward Sword might make you feel invincible. But here, you're going to need every heart piece you can find. And it's not just combat that poses a challenge in this quest either. This was an age before helpful companions to provide you with hints. And even after a number of playthroughs over the years, I still find myself getting lost at some points. Okay, so opening up the world map does give you pretty clear waypoints of where you should go next, which is more than can be said for the previous two games. But it's the journey to these waypoints, the route from point A to point B, that requires some detective work. And I'm all for it! Tell me what the next goal is, but let me figure out how to get there. That's what made the first two games so magical for me, and it's why Breath of the Wild was such a welcome return to form. If we're being honest though, the journey between these points is really just the filling. The mortar between the bricks. The bricks themselves are the dungeons. And oh my goodness, does this game's dungeons absolutely slay expectations. The Legend of Zelda gave us nine dungeons that could be approached in pretty much any order. Then Zelda 2 shortened that list to seven and sequenced them to make room for more fleshed out scenarios between the palaces. A Link to the Past though? comes in hot with a whopping 13 dungeons across its two worlds. That's a ton of content! And as far as progression goes, this game actually blends the previous two approaches by creating this accordion-like structure that Mark Brown talks about in his Boss Keys series. There's consistent forward momentum like Zelda 2, but you often have the freedom to choose your route like Zelda 1. The difficulty of each dungeon generally increases as you progress. Dark World dungeons are more complex than those in the Light World, but there's enough variety in the types of challenges you're presented with that it feels totally fine to do things out of order. Regardless of the order you decide on though, your first step in the dark world is going to be the Palace of Darkness. By this point in your journey, you've gotten to experience a good mix of towers and temples in the light world. You've gathered the three pendants of courage, claimed the Blade of Evil's Bane, and to your surprise, discovered that your quest isn't even half over yet. And whereas the first batch of dungeons were relatively straightforward, this dark palace is no slouch. You got loads of keys to access several possible paths, and there's no single option that feels like the obvious way forward. It's confusing, it's menacing, and yes, it's pretty dark too. And this is only one of the many unique labyrinths throughout the dark world. You got the swamp palace, which requires you to move water across both dimensions, Skull Woods, which takes place both above and under the ground, and generally just trolls you the whole way through. And then there's everyone's favorite, the Ice Palace, which has you slipping around this claustrophobic loop of one-way corridors. Seriously, screw that place. The non-linear navigational gameplay that made the original dungeon so fascinating is still here in all its glory. 
but A Link to the Past layers in complex puzzles and unique themes to create truly remarkable spaces that are pretty hard to find elsewhere in gaming. There's a reason why the conversation around any new Zelda game almost always finds its way to the dungeons. And this is also why I, along with many others, was a little underwhelmed by Breath of the Wild's Divine Beasts. Zelda dungeons are the cross-section of varied level design, expertly crafted puzzles, and thrilling combat. And that legacy can be traced right back to this game. Each and every temple, palace, and tower is filled to the brim with unique character and personality. These aren't just palette swaps of each other with slightly different layouts. They're, as Boss Keys puts it, unique, complex puzzle boxes that occupy a real space in Hyrule. I could talk all day about just the puzzles, just the theming, or just the bosses, but this game shows that the magic of Zelda is a combination of all those elements. The Legend of Zelda may have introduced the unique concept of Zelda dungeons, but this is the first game that unlocked their true potential. So I've mentioned Breath of the Wild quite a bit throughout this episode, and there's a reason for that. It was the first time in nearly three decades the Zelda team had revisited their core conventions in a major way, and there was a lot of discussion around its release about the Zelda formula and why it needed to be changed. And sure, that formula might have been slightly overdone by 2017, but it had become ubiquitous in the series for a reason. The Legend of Zelda has come to define the adventure genre with its unique blend of epic encounters and creative puzzles. And although that foundation was certainly laid out from the beginning, it was a link to the past that truly cemented this legacy. It may have expanded the world, filled out Link's arsenal, and introduced the Master Sword, but it also blended its past influences to usher in the future of the series. It's not just a great game that influenced others, it's also a product of those that came before. And while that's true of pretty much every work of art out there, I appreciate how A Link to the Past wears this inspiration as a badge of honor, proudly running where its predecessors had walked. Who are some of my greatest influences? And who has pushed me forward in my journey? I turned 27 this year, and I'm incredibly grateful for where I've been led in my life but I didn't make it here by myself. Just like this game, I too am a product of those who have poured into me. Some of those influences have been life-giving, whereas others have left me wounded and broken. But through the highs and the lows, I believe I've been led to such beautiful growth and healing, and for that I'm grateful. But how about you? Can you think of something in your past that you can be grateful for today? Maybe not, and you know what, that's okay but I want to encourage you to look for the beauty in your hurt and the purpose in your pain. You are who you are for a reason. And I don't care if it sounds cheesy. That's pretty special. Thanks so much for watching. This episode goes out to an old mentor of mine, Mark. You were the first one to show me that I had a deeper purpose in this life, and you'll always be part of my story, brother. Thank you for showing me the love of Jesus, friend. And as for the rest of y'all, I want you to know that you are loved, you're valuable, and you are creative. God bless y'all. Have a great day.